the picture behind me is an empty cup. And what I want to talk about is, as you well know, the scenario that this cup will never be filled in the coming years because the coffee industry or the coffee uh, farms may be or are being attacked severely by a variety of diseases, Roya being one of them. And there are others coming with climate change. And there's also indication that farmers, as we well know and I will show you, may actually not be that interested in growing coffee simply because it's simply insufficient for them to feed their families and, and themselves. And there may very well be a shift out of coffee. Smallholder coffee farmers, which are the principal suppliers for specialty coffee, are struggling. And we've known this struggle for quite a while. We've increased the pricing to them from using fair trade organization systems as well as other systems. We have built schools. We have uh, provided them with health care. We've built kitchen gardens, we've done an awful lot of things, but the fundamental problem of extreme poverty in most of these areas has simply not been solved. It's frustrating for you all. It's certainly frustrating for an organization like Heifer, which deals with extreme poverty and hunger. So what do we do? Uh, smallholder farmers have not actually been waiting for us to solve their problem. They have taken two basic strategies to solve this problem. They've immigrated or they've reduced their food intake to essentially deal with the lack of food and the lack of, of nourishment. And the immigration thing, that if you want to put some numbers to it, is that the total development age, you know, USAID, World Bank, United Nations, European Union, essentially spends about $135 billion a year supporting a wide variety of poverty programs uh, all over the world, not just with coffee, obviously. Interestingly enough, the remittances that come from the immigrants, uh, smallholder farmers from all over the world, whether it be Africa or Central America or elsewhere, is $500 billion a year and growing very rapidly. So the extreme poor have essentially taken uh, things into their own hands and have gone to places where they can earn enough money to feed their families. And of course it's had incredible social, negative social and familial impact, breakdown of families, breakdown of societies, communities. Uh, it's supported uh, the sex trafficking and a whole bunch of highly negative systems. So that's not a, li that's not a sustainable solution for, for those communities. So we're faced with a wicked problem. It sounds colloquial, but it's actually got a definition which you can read, and it has to do with a whole bunch of system colliding and essentially aggravating each other's uh, negative effects. So how do we end endemic poverty? It's both important and urgent from obviously a moral point of view and also from a sustainability and, and viable coffee industry, coffee supply. But it's not all about coffee. That's one of the messages today. It's not all about coffee. What is the trap? the economic social trap that actually leads to this lack of escape. You know, a trap is sort of defined as a place where you simply are. All of the systems around you just aggravate the problem as opposed to solving it. It's a, it's a negative cycle. One of the ways to think about the trap is to think about the actual earnings of the families that supply you, supply us all with the coffee, and what would be a dignified income. And here in Seattle, I think this concept of a living wage it's sort of the epicenter in the United States for this idea, and I think uh, the city here, the city council, I think, passed uh, an ordinance over the next few years where minimum wage will be at $15. That's the same basic idea that I'm talking about. What is the current income of these families, and what is a dignified income? I call it a dignified income. It could be called a living income. So let me introduce you to Virginia Carrillo. She is from Guatemala. She has eight kids. She and her family earn about $3,285 a year. For a family of 10, in Guatemala, in the region she lives, a dignified income is $15,500. So there's a gap of about $12,000. She farms about two and three quarter hectares. She has about three activities on the farm and two outside of the farm. And obviously, she's living, her uh, family is living in extreme poverty. The income gap is huge, and she has both an income gap and an optimization gap. So how do we close this gap? What is a strategy or a set of strategies to close this gap? The first one is diversification. You simply can't live on coffee alone. I mean, you do the analysis, you will know that you cannot live on coffee alone. And then whatever other activities you're engaged in, how do you optimize that? So for her, um, and the mindset that this creates, this idea of understanding the gap, is critically important. Here's why. For a long time, Heifer was always organized around, you know, either placing goats, and I hope many of you bought, you know, sheep and chickens and everything else. But the placement of an animal or livestock in a family was always measured by the income impact it had and the percentage increase improvement that was created. 
So with Virginia, we actually placed bees, and she, she happens to be a very good beekeeper, and she was able to manage about five hives and generate about $1,000 of incremental income. Pretty good. It's 1,000 over 3,285, so that's about, what, 30% increase. So we kind of celebrate a 30% increase. But if you now begin to think of it as a gap, we've reduced the cap from $12,000 a year to a dignified income down to 11. That's progress, but it's really a long way from a living income. It's a long way from actually escaping that trap that just keeps cycling back and bringing that family down because it isn't enough to house, etc. So we need to think holistically. We need to think from a demand-driven agricultural development, what we call pro-poor, wealth-creating value chains. And by wealth creating, we don't mean just financial, we need educational, infrastructural, et cetera. All of those aspects of life that make life worth living and, and, and live in dignity. So the Sustainable Food Lab, with whom we work a little bit, has got this fairly simple system on how to evaluate and actually how to establish a living income. I've just put it up there as a slide. You may want to go to their website. But essentially, it identifies all those buckets that are required to live a life of reasonable dignity. Let me introduce you to someone with whom we've worked on this problem. This is uh, Ricardo Hook. He's got five kids in Guatemala. He grew corn, coffee, and beans. He has two and a half acres and three lots, one of which is very steep, on which he grows most of his coffee. Working with him, we convinced him to diversify his agricultural output to tomatoes, cucumber, watermelon, cantaloupe, French bean, papaya. He also has citrus, coffee, uh, cardamom. He's also done some aquaculture with fish and snails. So he's got this very balanced agroecological farm where the waste from one piece goes actually to feed the other and uh, fertilize it, et cetera. It's actually a very wonderful place to be. Um, and so what happened to his income? He was around 80 cents per person per day, and now he's moved himself. He's $1.44. He needs about $4 per person per day, and we've gotten him to $1.44. So his opportunity is actually to optimize this whole system. How do you actually optimize the farm? And so we do an analysis, and now he actually can do this kind of work himself. The red bar is the one to focus on. That's the net income or the net cash flow per land space, acre, or whatever measure you want to use. Notice that if he was able to convert all of his land to fish, to aquaculture, he'd do quite well. He would actually earn $27,000 a year for his farm. He can't do that. The, the land isn't quite suitable for that. But notice where coffee is. It's not a very high return. So from his point of view, if he looks at it on a portfolio basis, he's going to think hard about whether he should convert some of his coffee crop or coffee land to another crop that's more profitable so that he can feed his family. This is representative of a program we have in Tanzania that's supported by the Starbucks Foundation. There we're working with 5,000 smallholder coffee farmers. Uh, they were or are not making a livable income on their coffee, but the addition of dairy to their portfolio of activities provides them with substantial opportunities. One is a daily cash flow, right? If you manage your herd right, or you manage your, your cows correctly with the appropriate management of the reproductive cycle, good forage, good feeding, good health care, um, if everything is well managed, which is the kind of training Heifer provides, then you have a daily cash flow. And that changes everything, as you can imagine. Uh, in addition to the, the livestock management training that we provide, we're also building a hub for the 5,000 farmers to actually send or deliver their daily milk to a refrigerated, essentially refrigerated aggregation sit, uh, plant so that this milk can be aggregated, collected, and then sold to processes in, in Tanzania. What this provides is an opportunity, because the cash flow is actually quite profitable, um, this provides the opportunity for the farmers to consider and able to spend more money on the productivity of their coffee, or the quality and the productivity of their coffee land. So you begin to have a positive virtuous cycle that can take them out of, of party. We've just started this project, and uh, perhaps next year we can update you on, on the results of that. But that kind of integrated holistic activity is what can change everything. And of course, the work that we've been doing and you've been doing across all coffee land, which is to improve technologies, needs to go on. Uh, productivity, quality, all of that work needs to be done, but it needs to be done in the context of the holistic view, the farm portfolio, if you like, that uh, the farmers that we deal with. So many people are involved with that. Uh, I see the Alliance, a lot of fair trade organizations and others are working on that. Also, if you think about the value chain in coffee or any other uh, value chain, supply chain, 
the farmers are at the very early part of the value chain where there is the most risk and the lowest return. So how do you actually think about the farmers moving forward into the value chain and earning or capturing more of the value so that they can actually live uh, a dignified life? And uh, I've heard about Thrive uh, Farmers as an example where this idea, I think, has been taken to a very interesting uh, status. And you probably know, many of you probably know this man, Omar Rodriguez of Capucas in, in Honduras. And to his left, there are two women there who have developed a point of view or an approach on how to capture more of the value chain. Women-owned farms who are capturing the coffee, improving the quality, roasting it, packaging, and retailing it for the local market. So that particular avenue is providing substantial opportunity, not only for income, but to develop business skills and an approach to their lives that uh, substantially creates more autonomy and self-reliance, which can be done on dairy, can be done on flowers, can be done on vegetables, can be done across any value chain. But the idea that you think about the marketplace and understand what demand is and what the profitability of that particular component of the, of the value chain that you're working with is important. The coffee industry, us, and people who work with, in coffee lands, and those of you who obviously source your product from coffee lands, I think we have two imperatives. The first is to have a viable, sustainable, and constantly improving sector, and you're working hard on that. The other one is a sort of a moral imperative, and it's this belief that I would suggest to you that the cost of your coffee cannot come at the cost of the dignity of the smallholder farmer. My guess is 100% of you believe that. But how do we change our behavior? How do we think about coffee lands in such a way that we don't do it at the expense, that we don't sit in, in some kind of denial about what is actually happening in coffee land? We come across far too many communities who are suffering. So dignified income is one, one principle. We must embrace an understanding of what the reality is. So educate yourselves on not only their reality, but what can they do? What are the options? And I would suggest that you think about a relentless data and relentless quantification of what is life like and what the opportunities are. What is the opportunity with agriculture? What are the numbers behind that? You need to be familiar with that so that you can engage in dialogue that's constructive as opposed to just theoretical or qualitative. What is the opportunity for dairy? What's the opportunity for cardamom? What's the opportunity for honey? Uh, and then, of course, more niche kind of products like mushrooms. And, of course, don't forget handicrafts and general business practices or, or abilities. That's an important component of developing a mindset from being perhaps dependent on fate, and that's just the way I live, and becoming more autonomous and self-reliant and taking action to escape their poverty, primarily through their own efforts. So think holistically, open up to the fact that you've got to think outside the cup. You need a broad expertise to support the farmers. Remember this idea, if you may, if I could ask you, is pro-poor, wealth-creating value chains, we're willing to help. We need to end extreme poverty. We need to maintain the coffee, uh, coffee value chain so that it is profitable for all players. Many people are already doing this, of course. Uh, Coalition for Coffee Communities is doing. The cocoa industry is facing the same situation in Ghana and Ivory Coast and Central America. Uh, sustainable Food Lab has several case studies on how to approach this thing and how to think it and how to frame the problem. So. My final word is think outside the cup so that we can fill the cup. Thank you very much.